Our next speaker is David Bonson. Uh, David Bonson currently serves as Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner at the Bonson Group, which manages over $3.5 billion in assets with offices in Newport Beach and New York City. David has an extensive background in economics, wealth management, and market analysis, and he serves as Senior Fellow at, of Economics and Finance at the Center for Cultural Leadership. David serves on the board of several nonprofits and is involved in multiple podcasts, including his, uh, he hosts for the Dividend Cafe, uh, which I, I just started listening to the last few weeks and really enjoyed that. He is involved in um, also a weekly segment uh, that I, I virtually never miss this. Uh, it's a, uh, a little... Uh, overview of what's going on in economics and, and markets globally. Um, he does that, it's titled The Money Beat with World News Group, um, which is fabulous. Um, he is a frequent guest on CNBC, Bloomberg, and Bo uh, Fox Business, and is author of several books, including his recent title, There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths. Uh, please join me in welcoming David Bonson. Appreciate it. All right, how's everyone doing today? I'm ready to get radical. I'm not holding back. I debated if I was going to really tell you everything on my mind or was going to kind of take it easy because it's a new crowd. I only know a couple of you, but I don't feel any need to hold back. I'm just going to go for it. All right. I have a question. How many of you ever heard of the economist Milton Friedman? Does that name ring a bell to anyone? Most of you. You've heard of his uh, famous work that was both a best-selling book, and by best-selling, I mean number one on the New York Times best-selling list in the 1970s, and it was a very famous documentary on this thing called PBS. How many of you under the age of 40 have ever heard of PBS? It was like Netflix, but without entering a password. Um, Free to Choose was this huge documentary on PBS in the late 1970s. The title of my speech today is Free to Flourish, a contemporary case for creational economics. And I am not rooting the title of my speech in a dig at Milton Friedman, who is one of my mentors in economics. And the title Free to Choose, I do not believe to be an error or problematic. But I say free to flourish because I'm speaking on a somewhat different subject. I believe that the theology of work that we're here to talk about at the conference today and that is the subject of my very address is fundamentally about the objective or aim of flourishing. And I'm going to try to define that a bit better in my talk. Where what Milton Friedman was referring to, free to choose, and the notion of a type of freedom in the society we want to have to be able to make choices as producers and as consumers, um, I view the freedom of choice as a means, the ability to choose the way in which we want to live, the way in which we want to work, the way in which we want to transact in the marketplace. I think it's vitally important, but it's a means to an end. The end that I am here to talk about today is the goal of human flourishing. And it's my belief that our theology of work comes from a theology of enterprise that is rooted in the story and the doctrine of creation. Hence the subtitle, a Contemporary Case for Creational Economics. Uh, I am very ecumenical in this topic, and what I mean by the fact is that there are men and women of all different backgrounds and traditions in the Christian faith that I presume are here today, and that are often an audience of this topic. And I'm not interested in just a uh, Methodist audience to embrace this topic, or a Catholic audience, or a Protestant, or Reformed. There's a number of different backgrounds, traditions, and theological distinctives. Uh, but one of the great advantages of this topic that I've chosen as my mission in life, working in finance and having strongly held views as an economist about a theology of business, 
um, as, for someone who is particularly exhausted by theological differences and, and non-ecumenical frameworks, this is a topic that ought to appeal and be uh, able to kind of serve in the common ground of people of all traditions within the Christian faith. So I take for granted I will offend no one to quote, to start off my talk, Pope John Paul the Great, previously known as Pope John Paul II of the late 20th century, through work man must earn his daily bread, it's simple enough, and contribute to the continual advance of science and technology and above all to elevating unceasingly the cultural and moral level of the society within which he lives in community with those who belong to the same family. And work means any activity by mankind, whether manual or intellectual, whatever its nature or circumstances, it means any human activity that can and must be recognized as work. In the midst of all the many activities of which mankind is capable and to which he is predisposed by his very nature, by virtue of humanity itself, man is made to be in the visible universe an image and likeness of God. And he is placed in it in order to subdue the earth. From the beginning, therefore, man is called to work. Work is one of the characteristics that distinguish man from the rest of the creatures, whose activity for sustaining their lives cannot be called work. Only mankind is capable of work, and only man works. At the same time, by work, occupying his existence on earth. Thus, work bears a particular mark of man and of humanity, of the human person. The mark of a person operating within a community. And this mark decides its interior characteristics. In a sense, work constitutes our very nature. So I want to give you eight very brief points over the next three hours of my lecture. <laughs> I may have that wrong how long I'm supposed to go. We'll just riff and see where we end up. <laughs> I have a flight actually, so you know, you can always reschedule. Um, I have eight points I am gonna go through briefly and we're having a, a panel and Q&A afterwards. Um, I don't believe that anything I'm going to say is controversial. I certainly don't want it to be. I never want anything I say to be controversial. There's, there are certain things that I'll talk about publicly that I know are controversial, but it, I, I never desire that. It's never the aim. And I think it's wrong to be pursuing controversy for controversy's sake. But I am frankly tired of people addressing the subject of work on eggshells. I'm particularly tired of people who know better. So I don't think a lot of people know better. I think a lot of people, it's new to them. They've been brought up to believe that work is a means to an end and a very unfortunate one at that. And our goal in life is to ha get to work as little as possible. But unfortunately, we have this thing called bills to get in the way. That's the framework of society. And then if you just do well enough, either because you strike it big or you just kind of save enough over the years of working that one day you get to the point where you can enjoy this thing called a 30 year vacation. And that um, is so theologically abhorrent to me that I am tired of talking about it in a nice way. So um, the, if anything I say today sounds a bit edgy, and I don't think it will, but I'm just sort of warning in advance. It's not my intent. But I feel strongly about some of the theological claims that I'm going to make in this talk. And they're not just theological because they reflect my view of God, but all theology reflects our view of God. But they reflect what God has taught me about my view of you, about my view of me. That is, as Pope John Paul the Great referred to, our view of the human person. So the book that he referred to as being out on the pad, on the, in the lobby area, uh, that we have here for you today that just came out a couple months ago. It, um, when I say there's no free lunch, 250 economic truths, the very foundational truths of the book are rooted in this truth, that economics, our study of work, are both fundamentally starting points of the human activity, the human person. So we're gonna try to unpack a little bit of that. Some of this, by the way, um, I think you see the spelling of my name in your, in your program. I'm gonna give you all right now my email. I don't think it's up on the board there and you see my spelling up there, but my email is dbonson at thebonsongroup.com. 
And I have taken to, I, I gave a speech this week in Dallas. I gave a speech last week in Washington, D.C. And as these different events have been going on lately, uh, particularly in the last three months since the book came out, um, I have found that there can be great opportunity for exchange afterwards, and I actually work about 18 hours a day and um, sleep at, to the level necessary to sustain myself and, and not, you know, be like tired. Does that make sense? Sleep enough to not be tired. Does that work for you? I am very happy to interact with you all by email afterwards because I don't think me being up on a stage in a limited time we have today is necessarily going to be sufficient. But if I do say anything that provokes further thought, I want to um, engage in that both fellowship and dialogue with you. So I invite you uh, to email further if there are indeed questions or things you want to yell at me about. So number one, work is a transitive activity. That is to say... It's an activity that begins in the human subject, but is directed towards an external object. That's a mouthful. The other nine, I said eight, there's going to be 10 points. The other nine are not as heavy. The first one has got some weird words, so I'll unpack it. Work is a transitive activity. It's beginning in the human subject. That's you, the human person. The human person is the subject of work but it's directed towards an external object. And we're going to talk about what that means. Now, we already have gotten a bit of introduction this morning in our opening comments about Genesis 1, but number, point number two is that work is the verb of the creation mandate. Genesis chapter 1, and particularly part of the verse you heard earlier, I'm going to expand more on that passage right now. It reflects the actions of God the creator who worked in creating the earth and man bears the image of God in his role as co-creator. So this is the first thing I think I'm saying that is subject to controversy if, it is, if you work hard enough at misinterpreting what I'm saying. So you're going to have to really try to read me in a very bad light to make this controversial. But I am saying that all of you are co-creators with God. And I am saying that you were created to be a co-creator with God. And I am well aware that none of you or me have the ability to create ex nihilo. So like everything in the relationship between God and man, there are two categories, the transcendent and the imminent, the things we share with God, the things that we do not. The secret things belong to the Lord. But of course, God making us in his image made us with certain attributes of his that he shared with us. One of the things he did not share with us is the ability to create ex nihilo, out of nothing, the way God was able to speak the world into existence. But one of the things he did create with, and share with us, and this is perhaps one of the most important attributes of our existence, is our creative capacity. It was not merely an ability he gave us, a talent, but it was a mandate. It was a command. It was a function. And I will argue it was our purpose to now take what God himself created only with potential and for us to go bring it into the actual. I'm going to expand on that further. Number three, work is the fundamental dimension of human existence on earth. The fundamental dimension of human existence on earth. All consumption has always required first production. Think about this for a second. This began in the Garden of Eden. Those of us who want to believe that we're here to consume, to taste and see that the Lord is good, to enjoy wonderful things, to enjoy blessings and bounty, all of which I'm overwhelmingly for, there is no possibility of us consuming, enjoying all these different verbs you could apply to some of these parts of the human experience that include entertainment, recreation, rest, uh, what have you apart from someone first producing. Generally, it requires two parts production. You have to produce till you have the means to be able to consume, but someone else had to produce for you to have something. 
to consume. So the sin qua non, the without this, no possibility of our consumption is production. The productive and innovative and creative work that must go in to a functioning society. But not just a functioning society in a sense of social cooperation, social organization, civilization. All that's pretty important. We've come a long way. I'm saying just the mere existence on earth. We cannot consume until we first produce. So at the most base level, back to the Garden of Eden, if you believe the only thing you're here on earth to do is eat and drink water so you can stay alive, and I hope you have a higher vision of your calling than that. But even if you believe that's all there was to this whole crazy thing called life, you cannot eat of the vegetation and animal kingdom God provided for your sustenance without working. I promise, not, I don't hunt, but I've heard it's work. <laughs> Number four, subdue, cultivate, have dominion, inhabit. There's a lot of verbs. There's a lot of vocabulary, all of which I'm extracting verbatim, explicit biblical terminology from Genesis chapter one. They are utterly incoherent if you do not understand them holistically. It means the mandate that mankind discover and optimize all the resources of the earth. What are the resources of the earth called? Creation. We then, when we talk about subdue, cultivate, dominion, inhabit, all these things, stewardship, right? We add to those resources of creation the uniquely human dimensions, Ideas, intellect, reason, science, technology, risk. Humans take risk with raw material, with ideas, profit and loss towards the aim of something bigger and better. This unbelievable growth agenda of the Bible. Number five, these truths are universal. They're applicable to all of humanity. Not merely the gifted, not merely the affluent, not merely anyone of a particular faith or, or position or status. The rich, the poor, the modern, the ancient are all subject to this teleology. We are designed as creative creatures. Pursuits to avoid or abandon this fundamental universal fact leads only to alienation, confusion, and separation. I generally find myself on the other side of the debate these days when people are worried that one of the great causes of social alienation and tribalization and frustration and the opioid epidemic and all of the social maladies that we can see around us, generally, those who believe it is because of too much work, I find to be missing the mark. I believe that a restored theology in proper context of a creational understanding of work is indeed the antidote to that very alienation and confusion, and that this is applicable to all of humanity, that there is not two classes of people, those who are capable of being productive and those who are not, that God created all mankind with dignity in his image. Number six, dominion over the animals. So provisions of food and shelter, extraction of natural resources. They're all legitimate work functions. But the history of work since the creation account is a history of linking the natural world, which was made by God, to the innovative capacity of mankind, which, by the way, this innovation is godlike. We have a godlike capacity by design, linking the natural world to mankind's innovative capacity is itself the story of civilization, the story of economics, the story of great progress throughout history, and provides the vehicle for people to enjoy a higher quality of life and a greater aim of human flourishing. So therefore, when I to put a different vocabulary on it, when I talk about the natural world being linked to mankind's uh, an innovative talent, that's, the word for that you could say is technology, 
right? Modern technology is not then the enemy of the creation mandate, but rather an application of it, albeit one ripe for abuse and violation. We find violations in technology, in certain modern conventions of this dominion garden creation mandate when we, now this moves to number seven, undermine the human person as the purpose of the work. So what I'm doing here by talking about number six is reiterating the point of the history of these things being the natural world being linked to uh, technology, to innovation, okay? But I want this to accelerate, not undermine point number seven, which is the human person is the purpose of the work. And now I'm going to get a bit philosophical. It, it may get a little tricky, but I don't think I'm saying anything today more important than this. And so bear with me if it sounds confusing, but I believe I'm going to unpack it in a way that will make sense. The human person is the object of work. When you go to work to provide a good or service, there has to be another person benefiting from it, or at some point the work becomes obsolete and futile. There will not be a market for the work. I don't think anyone has a problem with that. But the human person is primarily the subject of the work in Christian theology. In this, we find the realization of our humanity. The human person flourishes in obedience of productive activity. Our modern class system has labeled some forms of work as more elegant or elite than others. And indeed, price discovery, I'll explain what that means if you want, price discovery in markets gives us information about the cost of, of certain work functions versus others. We will pay more for high-end lawyers than we generally will for the work of busboys at a restaurant. And I think that's a vital and useful market mechanism. I think the distinguishing prices that we put on different forms of labor in its market function is not only entirely leg legitimate, but entirely necessary. And if you remove pricing and market function from how different jobs have different wages and things of that nature, you undermine the ability to have a free society. But this is the point I'm making. We must never forget that the basis for determining the value of human work, now we're speaking theologically, is not primarily the kind of work being done. The kind of work being done matters to what it will uh, uh, generate in the marketplace. What one will pay for a professor, a lawyer, a busboy, that matters in a market context. In the context of fundamental intrinsic value, the kind of work being done is not the primary uh, consideration but it is the fact that the one who is doing it is a human person. The sources of the dignity of work are to be sought primarily in the subjective dimension, not the objective. Objectively, we will pay a lawyer more than a busboy. Subjectively, that busboy's work is just as relevant to God as he is a productive agent in creation as the lawyer. This distinction enables us to entirely cast aside the absurdity of 150 years of class struggle division. Because two things can be true at once, contra Marx and contra secular capitalists who miss this point. A Christian market view understands that the dignity of lower end workers and higher end workers is the same in the eyes of God because of the subjective value, the person doing the work with dignity. Objectively, we understand market mechanisms price things differently. We work for man and not for work, okay? Is the man at the essence of the work, is that man the person being worked for or is it the person working? The answer is yes. It's a miracle of work, the subjective and objective together always primarily in dignity focused on the subjective. Number eight. You know why you're going to have to email me is you're going to need my outline because there's no way you're writing all this down. I know that. I mean, I didn't, 
I'm kind of making up the numbers anyways. I don't even really know how they all line up here. Work is not merely merchandise, but it is certainly a mechanism of the market. So two things are true at once that are inconvenient truths, either for Ayn Rand objectivist or collectivist central planners. A, mankind is not merely part of the material means of production. They are not mere instrumentation. Mankind is the purpose of production. Yet, number two, mankind's work is indeed subject to market mechanisms. There is something called the subjective theory of value that totally changed economics. In the late, in mid to late 19th century, we understand now that if I work and work and work and work to build a table, and I put so much into it and so much labor addition goes into it, and my table is awful, you are not going to pay me what I want for the table if you don't like it. And we know this intrinsically. The value of the table is not the work I put into it, the sacrifice I put into it, even the parts and cost and labor and materials. The value of the table is what? What you say it is. There's a subjective theory of value, but we need market mechanisms for pricing of that value, the things you do in the workforce, we need rule of law. We need people to enforce contracts. We need to have a civilized uh, society. We need to be free of the interventions of disinterested third parties. If I'm building a table and someone wants to pay me a certain amount for it, we don't need someone else who has nothing to do with the transaction to come and tell you what the table ought to be priced. So we need freedom in transaction, but never to confuse the transaction what's happening in the marketplace as the essence of the production. I, the, the work of mankind is not just an addition to a, a production function, it is the purpose of the production. Mankind existentially living out what God asked mankind to be and to do out of the garden. Number nine, work corresponds to man's dignity, expresses this dignity, and increases it. Through work, man not only transforms nature, I, I hope you, you see how that has been true, over the years, work has been able to allow nature to accommodate significantly um, more comfortable lives, more dignifying lives. It adapts nature to the needs of mankind. God did not make the earth for the purpose of the earth he made the earth for the purpose of the human person. God's prioritization in creation of mankind being truly special, of him infusing to us dignity, this, I believe, is for all of the touchy feeliness of Christianity, totally missed. Because we like the touchy feeliness of the redemption story, of God loving us so much and seeing in our sin that we were separated from him and therefore in need of a savior and sending that redeemer to redeem us to him through Christ's work and resurrection from the cross, we understand this nature of God's love for us. But I believe we miss that the entire reason out of creation that God made humankind was that he made us with a particular dignity that is different than the dirt the ocean, the animals, the plants, the birds. We adopt nature to our needs and we achieve fulfillment as human beings in doing so. We become more a human being by more transformation of nature. I use this example. Usually I'm holding my phone, but I'll use the iPad. You understand that there's nothing in this incredible device and in your guys' phones you're holding, nothing that didn't exist 7,000 years ago. The, the raw materials, there's been no new materials created since creation. All that has happened is those materials have been transformed by the work of mankind, by different people, some of whom had a saving knowledge of Christ and some who did not, but by different people out of the, the creation mandate, producing, innovating, and working, co-creating, 
and adding their ideas. So yeah, we know silicon comes from sand in the, the digital age. We get the technology a little bit, but then the ideas, they get transposed into it. Trial and error, risk, loss, eventually successful product. This is all a byproduct of, of creative effort. This allows us to become even more human through more successful, productive work as God intended us to do. And then finally, work as flourishing. Work as flourishing. We imitate God in work and in rest. And this is a part that I cannot emphasize enough. Um, I have pretty strong opinions right now about culture's view of work and people's dissatisfaction, satisfaction, expectations, um, and that's okay. I, won't, I probably won't get into all that because there's a chance right now some of you still like me. I want to leave it that way for today. Um, I do believe that mankind was made to rest, and I believe that because God was made to rest and God modeled his vision for his creation by working and then resting. I believe that after, and this is all before sin, Everything we've talked about today with Genesis 1 comes before the fall. And then after the fall, we do know that there is now toil and work. And then this is a curse, that that extra toil is problematic. And so when people will say, look, I think that's great. You love work so much, David, but I'm sorry, this is a curse. We're not, work is not something we're supposed to enjoy. It's very clear from sin that work is actually supposed to be miserable. And of course, if you want to take that to its theological conclusion, you have to believe children are a curse because the very same passage said that women would suffer in the pains of childbirth. We know that we're talking about two beautiful and glorious things that now had some toil and some pain and some difficulty associated with it that was to be overcome. But to the extent we are to be imitators of Christ, and I want to apply my Trinitarian theology here, because we're talking about the way in which we're co-creators with God from the garden. But, you know, Christ did something interesting that we might consider our toil of work a little microcosm of. He had to overcome the toil of the cross. But this was a sacrifice. This was the ultimate sacrifice. It was painful, but it was glorious. And I believe in a small way, we're called to flourish through toil. And in this entire message I have today about our function on earth, the beauty of work, the dignity of work, I think you find a glimmer of the new life, the new heavens, new earth, the new good, the garden, but if I may, the celestial city, the future garden in our work. This represents God's purpose for mankind Right now, unfortunately, on this side of glory with sin and toil, frustration and challenge. So I don't, I don't offer utopia. I don't offer a vision of it all being entirely glorious, but I do believe it is existential. That it is, even with the difficulties and struggles we have, because we have those in relationships, we have them in marriage, we have them in child uh, rearing, in each dimension of the human existence, so the fact that work has frustration doesn't disqualify it from this component. But I believe it all speaks to that fundamental reason God made us, to work and be productive. To have that mission, that mission, that purpose, the, the word I use all the time is telos, our fundamental reason for being. That's where loneliness comes from. The people don't have a reason for being. We have a reason for being because God made us to be productive, creative, innovative stewards. He made it out of the garden and it will last all the way into the celestial city. At my company, we are very focused on results. We care a great deal about profits. We care about measurable growth. We care fundamentally more than anything about satisfied clients. We can't have growth or profits without satisfied clients. We have a very positive feedback loop in our business model, as all businesses ultimately do. You meet the needs of humanity with goods and services. You do it well, and they are happy, and you are happy. And this pro-cyclical understanding of enterprise plays out. 
But I want to make clear, there's a chicken and egg issue here at the heart of a Christian professional strategy. Those desired consequences, profits, growth, satisfied clients, satisfied customers, all these things, efficiencies, whatever else, these consequences must flow out of a mission, not the other way around. If your mission flows out of your profits and strategy and metrics, then you're running a transactional business. You have a transactional job, but not a creational one. A creational understanding of work is that the goal is always mission first, productivity, innovation, the strategy, the metrics, all that stuff comes second. It flows out of the mission. To God be the glory. Thank you very much.